Good afternoon from London, everybody. I know we have a global audience joining us here today. So good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are joining us from. I'm Siobhan Benita. I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar on behalf of Global Government Forum. It's a publishing house that serves civil servants all around the world. And together with our knowledge partner today, that's Coursera. So in terms of today's topic, it's all about upskilling the public sector workforce, looking at how government can develop the talent it needs. And it's true to say that many governments around the world at the moment are facing really quite difficult um, recruitment challenges as a number of issues, including public finances, um, rising inflation, the so-called great resignation, lots of people leaving the workforce, are combining to make it harder and harder for governments to find and retain the talent um, that they need. In this context, governments need to work even harder to make the most of the staff and the talent that they already have. So they need to develop plans for both the upskilling and the reskilling of their workforces. Now, in today's uh, webinar, we have a fantastic panel of expert speakers who are going to be looking at some of those um, key issues. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce our speakers and ask them to give us some opening remarks. But once they've spoken, it's your opportunity as the audience to put your questions um, to our speakers. So please make the most of this opportunity. We really do have a lot of expertise with us in this webinar. So on the whichever device you are using, you should see a Q&A function on your screen somewhere, a Q&A button. You can use that um, function, the Q&A button, at any point from now on to message in your questions. And once we've heard from our panel, we'll get through as many of those questions as we can throughout the webinar. So don't ask, don't wait to be asked, just message in those questions uh, whenever one comes to mind. So now I'm going to introduce our fantastic panel. So first, we will hear from Kyle Clark, who is Senior Product Marketing Manager at Coursera. Kyle helps shape the strategy, solutions and product roadmap for Coursera's public sector partnerships in more than 100 countries. And he has worked with governments, businesses and universities on five continents to build skills development programs. Then we will hear from Israel Pastor, who is Deputy Director of Learning at the Ministry of Finance and Civil Service at the National Institute of Public Administration in Spain. Israel has 20 plus years of experience as a senior manager in the Spanish State Public Administration, having served in a variety of ministries, including culture, health, environment and finance. In his current position, he's particularly interested in improving and streamlining training programs and quality training activities for senior civil servants. Then we'll hear from Vicky Elliott, who is Deputy Director for Public Sector Leadership at the Leadership College for Government in the UK's Cabinet Office. Vicky oversees the college's work to deliver programs and build networks for the most senior leaders in the UK's public sector. Vicky joined the team in 2020, having worked in a wide variety of roles and organisations across the UK civil service, including leading on climate change, trade missions and working with senior leaders on diversity and inclusion. Then we will hear from Emmanuel Kogomo, who is Chief Director in the Department of Public Service and Administration in South Africa. Emmanuel leads the Batopele, which is, translates as the People First Unit, whose focus is on the prof professionalization of the public service. He's coordinated the National Batopele Excellence Awards since their inception in 2013. Emmanuel has experience in senior positions across the South African public sector and previously launched the Community Development Workers Programme in the Gauteng Provincial Government. And last but by no means least, we will hear from Al Ram, who is Deputy Director General and Director of the Teaching Staff Administration at the Ministry of Education in Israel, where he's responsible for the entire continuum of teacher development from training in academic institutions, through absorption in the schools and professional development throughout their careers. Prior to his role at the Ministry of Education, Ale was the Executive Director of the Centre for Democratic Education. So I'm sure you'll agree with me that we really do have a fantastic panel of speakers with us here today. As I say, please take this opportunity to message in your questions. But without further ado, I'm gonna invite Kyle to give us his opening remarks. Over to you, Kyle. 
Right, Shivan, thank you so much. It's uh, wonderful to be here with all of you, and thank you uh, for taking the time to tune in. I'm also calling from uh, Cape Town in South Africa, so Emmanuel and I, I think, have a one up on the other people uh, representing both the continent and uh, this country. So I'm excited to get to speak with our other panelists and, and hear what they have to say. I'm going to lay a bit of the groundwork. So this is Coursera's perspective, again, working with around 100 different governments globally in different countries, uh, and wanted to give you a macro kind of perspective on what we're seeing when it comes to upskilling the public sector. Next slide, please. So four things we're going to discuss in the next five minutes or so is uh, starting with changing citizen expectations, then changing government employee expectations, and then we're going to talk about, so what? Why does that matter? And then we'll discuss some priority skills that we're seeing based on our work upskilling and reskilling government employees. Next slide, please. So first, uh, just looking at how services compare from a citizen standpoint, um, what we see is that citizens who use government are used to a time frame uh, that's a little bit longer. So for instance, I just got my passport renewed and the expectation is, okay, this might take two months. And that's something that citizens have dealt with for quite some time. However, the proliferation of new technology has set this new expectation for citizens that they can get everything, including their groceries, in two hours or less. And so one of the questions that people are asking themselves is if I can get you know, checkers in my case to deliver my groceries in less than two hours, why can't my government get me the right paperwork in less than two months? So we're seeing a shift in expectations that's putting more pressure on our government employees. Next slide, please. And in terms of what the employees themselves are looking at when they compare, say, government to the private sector, we're seeing a bit of a shift here as well. So in the public sector, the expectation or perception of job seekers, and these are new people who are coming in, um, maybe people who've graduated with de uh, degrees, maybe people with previous experience, they expect from the government that they might get paid a little bit less than they would in the private sector, and they may have somewhat slower career growth in terms of them not necessarily jumping around quite as much but they'll have higher stability, higher security, and then a higher sense of purpose serving that public mission. The challenge is that the perception of companies nowadays is also shifting a bit. So we're seeing this at or above market pay and fast career growth, which is something that we've seen for decades. But then the increasing sense of purpose is shifting some people and saying, well, I think I can make a bigger impact if I go get paid a lot of money to work for a company whose mission, quote unquote, is to, let's say, build a bunch of electric vehicles. So we're starting to see that blurring where the mission and the benefits may not be the same draw that they used to be. Next slide, please. In data and analytics in particular, we talk with governments all the time about how difficult it is to hire for people who have any range of skills involving using data. So what we can see from this slide, for instance, is that in the, the US, where we found the most abundant data to track this kind of thing, the median base salary for data science roles in the private sector is around $100,000 a year, whereas in the public sector, it's around $70,000 a year. And in addition, these roles often take up to 13% longer to hire for than other roles. So now we have this challenge where our public sector in countries around the world, and this is true outside of the US as well, are trying to recruit people into these critical skilled roles like data, for instance, and they're competing against a private sector that is also struggling to recruit these same people and yet is willing to pay more and recruit them faster. So that creates a number of additional challenges for us. If we go to the next slide, um, the question is, so what? So we've got changing citizen expectation, expectations. We've got changing employee expectations. It's difficult to recruit certain types of talent, people who may have data skills, for instance. What we're seeing is an increase in those citizen expectations leads to an increase on demands on public sector service delivery. I want more faster or want things more effectively, which leads to an increase in the need for talent who can build the apps, delivery systems, service capabilities, et cetera, in order to deliver those services which then leads us to a, uh, you know, in addition of a difficulty for hiring specific types of talent. And so we wind up with this issue where we're not able to attract the talent to, to deliver the services that we need, which leads to increased citizen dissatisfaction, which leads to more requirements of services that we're unable to recruit the talent for. And we get into the, a little bit of this cycle. And so there are a couple different options that we can consider as we look to address this. And I say this because these are the types of conversations we've been having with government officials in learning and development, primarily in an HR. The first is, well, we can do nothing about this. 
I don't think anybody likes this option because it means that we're continuously decreasing effective service delivery. The second option that we can consider here is we can outsource our talent and our skills. So I used to consult with the um, US federal government for a little while, and there are some things that seem to make sense to outsource, but a lot of abilities that really don't. And I don't think it's in the interest of governments and the public sector to just give away all of the challenges they're expected to solve and all of the talent that they need in order to solve those challenges. The third piece that we see then is a potential to actually build that talent. Okay, so it's difficult to hire people. Well, what about the people we have? How do we reskill and upskill those people into the areas that we most need? So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to just flash for you a, a brief look at the priority skills we're seeing in the public versus the private sector. Um, and if, if you can click next on this, Raquel, what we'll see is these yellow boxes popping up. These are some of the differences that we notice. A lot of the other same though. So for example, here in data science, what I wanted to call out is things like our programming and our studio are more popular in the public sector, which is interesting because what we hear from the private sector is R is this old economics-based way of doing data science. So there's some friction here in terms of what we're looking at, but also some really interesting uh, parts like in the public sector under tech, user research is a really popular skill people are learning. How do we design services for citizens, which I think is quite interesting. So if we go to the next slide, what we can see here are an example of just courses people take on Coursera. Um, and again, we can take a look at this a little bit later, but a lot of it is introductory to data, intro to technology. And then what we see from our business skills for the public sector is everybody wants to know, how do I use spreadsheets? Because they're easy and they're supposed to be effective. So we see public sector officials also looking to develop those skills through online learning. And then finally, um, before I pass it off, I just wanted to note that um, one of the big areas we're seeing, as I mentioned before, are data skills. We really think we can empower the public sector with data skills, and it happens at all levels. So it starts at the bottom with data literacy, and then we get to helping functional teams make data-driven decisions. And then finally, how do we help develop technical and data-based expertise? This isn't something that's just for the chosen few. We really need to infuse this across the public sector in order to make better decisions in order to have a better understanding of how to serve our citizens. So this is a big project for us, working with governments on this specific issue. Um, but again, just wanted to uh, lay a bit of groundwork for us. Uh, now though, I'd like to pass it off, I believe to Israel to address us uh, from his experience. Thank yeah. you. Thanks so much, Kyle. Just to recap before we go over to Israel. So really helpful to have that macro picture to set the scene uh, for the conversation. I think interesting what you said about the response to changing citizens' expectations and changing employee expectations and kind of what that has um, created in terms of this context. Um, and also, I think some of that blurring, again, between um, uh, some of the reasons why people used to choose a public sector career over a private sector career now getting a bit blurred in particular in terms of that sense of purpose um, and then pay still a really big issue but then coming right back down to um, uh, what you were looking at there in the types of skills that are needed across the public sector compared to the private sector and where providers like Coursera maybe can help uh, in terms of uh, bridging some of those uh, gaps. Thank you so much Kyle for that wonderful introduction. Israel we are coming over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sibon. Thank you for having me here this afternoon. I'm currently in Prague for an um, important meeting in the, in the business I am into, which is the you know, Schools of Government. I, I represent here the School of Government of Spain, which, uh, which is the National Institute for Public Administration. And as I say, I'm very happy to, to try to take this opportunity to share with you and to hear from experiences of what we do in this important area. Uh, well, let me start by saying that uh, European Commission has just declared the year 2023, the European Year of Skills, which um, um, includes digital skills like uh, one of the most important. And this goes to show how, how big the challenge we have. And, uh, not only to upskill those in the IT sector already, um, public servants that is, uh, but also to reskill uh, those who with cross-cutting skills or so generalist virtues. And uh, well, how does this apply in the Spanish administration? Well, first I, I need to give you some more context. Uh, moreover, what Kyle explained to us and uh, which I agree fully, 
and which gives us, uh, you know, the broader picture, which is uh, fantastic. But in Spain, the model of civil service plays a key role in, in not only in what we do, but in the challenges I'm referring to. First, it's, uh, let me simplify it at, at most, but uh, it's, it is a rigid model, right? We cannot grow or, or cut uh, easily. We also have a demographic crisis, as I call it, uh, meaning that uh, we uh, have aging civil servants and only in the last two, three, four years, uh, new recruitment is coming in to salvage the future, if you want to help us uh, from this, this uh, demographic uh, problem. And uh, referring to recruitment, uh, we, we have in place massive uh, programs to recruit the various profiles. But it's not only a matter of uh, quantity, how much do we need, which is a very difficult estimate because you know, not knowing what the future might bring, uh, well, look at this very year. Uh, but uh, also, uh, we tend to see IT professionals as, um, the, the, you know, uh, in, in a shortage, not only in the public administration, but as Kyle said very explicitly, mm -hmm. um, all over the market, uh, the labor market. But for us, it becomes a bit more trickier, if you want, to uh, try and bring in people who want to have or who might have uh, a public service calling uh, rather than talent, I, I would I would stress this different concept. I would like to say because uh, well, talent well, it's on us to develop it and try to upskill it and or reskill it where necessary. Uh, we also have some, uh, as I said, shortage of headcount or uh, comp in comparison with the workload and what society and and the, and the polity demands on uh, public administration, and then wow. in the Post pandemic, we've seen the, uh, the increase or the acceleration of uh, much of the trends we were experiencing uh, in, in, in the public services and in the administration itself. And then come next generation funds, uh, what we call resilience plans or recovery plans, whatever. Um, well, this is also something that we have to implement from within the administration. So many driving forces come around and well are we going to cope with all of that and 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 come out with a more successful in terms of uh, social and political legitimacy in in the country well uh, let me take the burden a little bit and stress the fact that we trust very much in what we do in terms of trying to bring some training to to bring that out the talent people in the administration and the new recruits uh, might uh, help us with to, to, uh, to get this challenge. So that is why if I focus now on what we do on online training, it is a trend that came, uh, as I said, uh, more intensely after the pandemic. It, it's now here to stay, but in the form of a blended learning with uh, dynamics, with uh, uh, practical ways of uh, learning and active learning also called and uh, well, nowadays in the Spanish uh, National Institute, uh, we have uh, half of the trainees, uh, we have them online, which is quite a challenge, meaning that uh, we train uh, in ballpark figures, uh, some 55,000 uh, people a year, last year at least, and having half of those uh, being trained online uh, well, I see that like, uh, you know, it's too much too soon, maybe, I don't know, but uh, let me uh, give you this, this idea. So we naturally tend to go to partnerships with companies. We, we go through public procurement because, uh, you know, this, uh, the administrative law is such a heavy thing to, to manage, but maybe that's what, what, why we are here uh, with the knowledge and experience in, in public uh, law. And then we have a key project I want to present you and maybe, um, well, stressing the fact that it's still an ongoing project. It's something that we need to uh, improve. And uh, that brings us to the complexities that will be my final point that we have with these uh, digital online pro uh, projects. And complexity coming from the administrative side, 
It's a team effort. Uh, we need uh, we we need to spend the budget. We need to go to public procurement. It's a pedagogical uh, mm. uh, ta a challenge too because we, we need to design learning pro uh, context. So 750 skills that are designed within the national framework that we passed last year. And then it's also a technical complexity that we're facing because it's cloud solutions, uh, maybe cloud to cloud to private clouds that we might uh, uh, procure, but the connecting with the uh, public or state run uh, uh, cloud that we have and platforms. Uh, so there, will there be a company able to do that? And the last complexity, but not least, is the uncertainty. How would be the future? What would this be sufficient? This that we are defining now, you know, struggling with uh, with uh, with reality, would that be enough to mm. better serve in the digital service of the future? I'll leave it up to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Israel. I mean, what a great second presentation there. Um, setting out lots of the challenges that I think will really resonate with people in the audience. So the civil service structure itself being quite rigid, playing, you know, in particular with the headcount issues, an aging civil service uh, workforce and the challenges of recruiting young talent into the service. Um, again, some of the issues that Kyle mentioned, you echoed there, the kind of competition for IT professionals across the labor market in particular, but really interested what you said about uh, changing the way you look at this. You're looking for the public service calling in people and the talent you can develop once you get them in, an interesting way of putting it there. And then also some of your other um, challenges around, even if you want to do online learning and blended learning at scale, you have to get the platforms in place, the technology in place, the procurement faster to be able to bring in external providers. And even if you do all of that, is it going to keep up speedily enough with the changes that we're seeing in the digital kind of world around us? So lots and lots of challenges there. Thank you so much, Israel, for that. Vicky, can you help solve some of those challenges? I'm coming over to you now. What a challenge. Thank you, Israel. And thank you, Siobhan. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to solve those challenges immediately, but I will um, describe to you a bit of a case study of the structure of how we are approaching it in the UK. Um, so I'm responsible for public sector leadership within what is a new organisation here in the Cabinet Office at the heart of the UK government, the Leadership College for Government. And the Leadership College for Government itself is part of a new initiative that we have um, called the Government Campus, really bringing together and focusing on the learning and development and skills, knowledge and networks that we expect our civil servants and wider public uh, sector leaders to have. So I'm going to step back a little bit and just give a few remarks about how we've come to where we are today and, and what we're going to do next. And um, so over the last few years in the UK, um, like many other countries, we have um, tackled the challenge of COVID and it has really shown us um, different ways of working that we've need, needed to have in public service, breaking down barriers between local and national and um, um, between policy and delivery and really making sure that we're working in a more joined up way. We've also had um, the change of leaving the EU, which has highlighted for us the need for um, UK civil servants and public sector leaders to perhaps work in different ways as well. So last year, our ministers and the senior civil servants came together and issued a declaration on government reform, recognising that challenges we've seen over the last few years really meant we needed to work in different ways. And one of the things that was in that um, declaration on reform was um, the creation of a government campus. So the government campus will bring together um, training and development and the skills, knowledge and networks that people need both in person and also online. It will look at what we need in central government, but it will also look, which is part of what my team does, at how we collaborate across the wider public sector, as we really had to do um, during COVID, with the health service, with fire, with police, um, with education leaders, so that we're not just thinking at the centre of government about what we do, but what we do uh, more broadly. So the creation of the campus um, will be centred around a five-strand framework so what we have created is um, five areas, the foundations of public administration. So the essential skills that mean you can work um, effectively as a public servant. And that might mean simple data analysis through to digital tools, as Kyle was talking about. It might mean how you chair a meeting, how you manage a budget, how you can write and present well, all things that every civil servant and public sector um, worker should feel that they are able to access if they need that training to really have the foundations of public administration. 
The second strand that we've identified is working in government. So making sure that people have a really comprehensive grounding in how government works. So for some people that will mean understanding the parliament. It will mean understanding in the UK how the different parts of the UK work together. Um, it might mean about how to write a government white paper with policy proposals in it or impact assessments so we can see how much things cost. So really the basics of what you need to work in government. The third strand is leadership and management, which is where our new leadership um, college for government has come in, um, making sure that all managers have got relevant practical skills to achieve the standards that we expect of every leader and manager, because management is just as important as, as leadership um, at every level in our organisations. And then fourthly, we've um, focused on specialist skills. So training by professions and for professions. So it's not all being done centrally, but um, by those who are experts in uh, law, finance, procurement, project delivery. And then finally, the fifth area we've identified is on domain knowledge. So the knowledge and understanding and the broad sector networks that we need to work effectively. And if you're in the health ministry to really make sure that you have access to training um, and knowledge about health, uh, transport, education, welfare, wherever you're working to make sure that you've got access to the training that you need and um, to be able to uh, operate at different levels within um, public administration and your domain. Um, and we also think that's really important for an understanding of the historical and global context of different policy areas so that we can make sure we're not forgetting what has worked or not worked in the past. Um, we also want to make sure that the training that we're providing within our campus is um, equitable and inclusive. So some of it is online, some of it is in person, um, but it really is open to all of the, our public servants. Um, and we're working really closely with lots of different partners. So across the wider public sector, as I've said, with health and uh, police, fire, others, they have their own training uh, organisations, um, but also with the private sector and with the third sector, because what we've discovered in establishing a government campus to give people the skills that they need is that we have far more in common um, in terms of the challenges of how we give people those skills um, than we do um, in terms of differences. And I, I think um, already today we've heard that uh, around the world we're facing far more similar challenges than, than we are different ones. So mm. delighted to be taking part this afternoon. And I'm going to leave it there um, and look forward to hearing some of the further challenges uh, that we're facing together. Great. Thank you so much, Vicky. Thanks for um, setting out what's going on in the UK. As you say, each country with its unique challenges. So in the UK, they've had the lead in the EU, which has raised kind of um, reflections on the skills that civil servants um, need. As you say, that getting that balance right between in-person and online training, something for people to um, consider there. The five strands that you, you mentioned, um, and what you said at the end about the domain knowledge in particular, don't reinvent the wheel. I think sometimes there is a tendency that we go in cycles on some of this and end up uh, doing uh, things that we've done before, not learning the lessons from the past. And then the importance of access to training and also looking across the wider public sector at some of our joint uh, kind of challenges and joint areas uh, that we can work together on. Thank you so much, Vicky. I'm sure people have lots of questions and drilling down into those five uh, levels, that you, five strands that you set out there. Emmanuel, we are coming over to you, back over to South Africa. We need to take off your mute, Emmanuel. We need to take you off mute. Sorry. No problem. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Shivan. And uh, hello to everybody who's joined. Um, yeah, now I'm going to start by looking at... Uh, sorry, next slide, please the introduction basically just the definition of the words what exactly do we mean by upskilling the workforce and uh, developing talent that government needs then public service training i look at that and what are the qualifications that uh, our various sectoral institutions uh, bring next next slide when we talk about upskilling uh, basically we're looking at how do we improve the skills level of the public service uh, workforce there are three ways in which we do that uh, one i'm saying it's training uh, starting with recruitment the courses that we provide for the incumbent uh, officials uh, but also looking at all levels of government starting from low levels what are the kind of courses that we need to improve uh, service delivery uh, wherever officials are being functional. Uh, the second area is induction. 
mainly for newly recruited and those staff that are promoted and then also in-service training. These are annual skills upgrades across all the levels of, of the public service. Now, in improving the skills level, we want to firstly improve service delivery. Uh, so the South African Public Service, our major focus is on improving service delivery, uh, but also the performance of the public service across government to ensure that uh, government can achieve uh, all the goals that it has set itself. So uh, training is done through uh, three major uh, areas. Government institutions, we have a National School of Government, which uh, mainly uh, doesn't operate on a campus level, but we have uh, partnerships with uh, the private sector, uh, service providers, who may uh, be running their own schools elsewhere, universities as well, may be part of that. Uh, we've got provincial public service schools and uh, also the sector education training uh, authorities, uh, starting from local government and then sectorally, for example, through health, uh, engineering, etc. We've also got a curriculum uh, that universities run uh, on public service, and then of course, uh, independent uh, private sector tertiary training uh, colleges that also run some courses to ensure that uh, there are pe people who are interested rather in joining the public service get some grounding. Now, what do we do to develop the talent that government needs? The main areas that uh, we look at is, of course, the government needs to influence the curriculum across all the training institutions, across, across all the sectors. So government will uh, of, uh, issue some policies that will assist in governing the kind of training curriculums that are required. Of course, there's the autonomy that is given to uh, various institutions. The curriculum has impact on staff proficiency, efficiencies, and effectiveness that all levels of staff must be included in the training programs from low level staff to professionals. And when we look at professionals, I mean here, uh, your educators, your health workers, engineers, and so on. And the artisans would be uh, your welders, electrical people, etc. And then we look also at the curriculum specifically for medium, senior, and executive management, uh, that basically your leadership levels. The duration of courses depend on the course content and also the medium that is used for instruction. Uh, since COVID, we're using more and more the web-based or online courses, but those then uh, depend on the speed of the learners. Um, mm -hmm. Minimum uh, would be a three month kind of course, but we, uh, sometimes we do have courses that take up to a year. Attendance and course accreditation certificates are issued upon completion. Uh, the public service training that happens in this way, as I said earlier, we start with the recruitment strategy. Uh, we target the right people so that we can attract uh, the right skills into the public service, develop their potential, and then empower them with the right skills uh, through the institutions that I've mentioned. We build capacity to ensure officials perform maximally we provide ongoing training annually for incumbent officials, whether it's formal or through informal courses. And we look at uh, the kind of courses will, will vary from um, administrative to project management, uh, professional uh, uh, courses and so on. But we also look at uh, cultural areas like ethical training. Uh, looking at uh, how to prevent corruption and uh, uh, fraud uh, in the public, broadly financial management and so mm. uh, incentives that are provided for especially low level staff so that uh, uh, as we proceed, we can be able to retain skills and deploy those skills in wherever it is required. Uh, for example, rural areas, not very few people want to work there. So there are more incentives for working in a rural area than uh, in an urban area. So basically, uh, qualifications that we provide, there's national qualification levels, two to six for artisans and other professionals, four to eight for administrative and managerial positions. And then there's a uh, specific certificate courses for entry level, as well as promotional uh, purposes. 
Uh, we have a, a program called Breaking Barriers for new public servants entrants, especially we targeting the youth to come into the public service. We have the new Gala. New Gala means rise up for aspiring senior and executive management levels. No one will get into those senior positions unless they've done uh, this course of new Gala. So in a nutshell, that's where uh, I will leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. So really interesting to hear that the kind of different providers that you have there, including using kind of private sector providers for some of the government uh, institution uh, training that you were talking about there. Um, also, as Vicky's saying, not just focusing on the civil service, but working across the wider public sector um, as well. Um, I think something that Israel mentioned as well, how COVID has basically sped up the use of online and web-based training also reflected uh, there in South Africa. Um, and then what you said there that others have mentioned again, um, using training to target young people in particular, so trying to recruit young people into the civil service, but also that you have kind of mandatory training that people are required to take before they can go uh, for promotions to certain levels. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for giving us that overview. And then last, but by no means, means least. Hale, I'm coming over to you now. We have to take you off mute. Thank yeah, sure, sure. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. And uh, it was a pleasure uh, to hear uh, my colleagues. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, I'll try to speak not about the whole public sector, about, about, the, about the teacher's uh, workforce and how to make it more attractive. I think it's a uh, it's a huge problem all over the world. So let's go. Okay. So first of all, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the last McKinsey uh, report that it said that 40% of the workers globally say that they might leave their job in the near future. I, I wonder how many, how, how many people here in this uh, session are thinking about it. Uh, but uh, I probably at least 40% of us and that's uh, that's the one of the main things that's happening in the world. Next slide, please. Um, and and when and when uh, McKinsey uh, show what are the reasons, so you can see it here. Uh, one of the main thing is lack of career development, uh, and of course uh, the compensation, the salary. But if you go to the twenty six, it's lack of uh, workplace flexibility. And that's one of the biggest problem with the teachers around the world, because once you came out from COVID-19, you wake up in the morning and you go to school. You cannot work three days at home from home or the flexibility around teaching is much more complicated. Next. And then that's why all over the world, we, we see a, a teacher shortage. Um, it's a big, it's a big, big issue, and it will uh, not going to change so quickly. Next one. In Israel, it's even uh, worse because the Israel is ranked the, the among the OECD countries the first in growth rate. The, the, we, I just traveled in uh, Europe, and every time I saw a family, what we call in Israel family, at least three kids, who is, <laughs> it, they were Israelis. It's unbelievable. So uh, the birth rate here is very, uh, and that's why I need to to recruit every year thousands of thousands of new teachers. While we are speaking now, I opened another three kindergartens and another almost another uh, full school. Mm. Next, and and I we have four four. Uh, uh, different education systems as well because we have the ultra orthodox and the Arabs and Jews and it's very hard to mix them between them. Uh, it's different uh, holidays, different uh, language sometimes, and uh, even geography. Uh, uh, we, we're trying to do it, but it's very very hard. Next one, and the, the, our last problem is that uh, the the gap between starting salary and maximum salary in Israel is also amongst the highest in the OECD. You can see that uh, South Korea and us, we are like in a different league from all the rest. And it's a, it's a huge, and, and it's because of historical uh, budgeting things. And uh, that's something that we have to change. So what, what we are doing, how can we deal with it when it's a, it's a global problem 
and and it's an Israeli challenge, a huge Israeli challenge. Next. So I'll, I'll show you four attractive solutions that we are going through. The first one is the uh, we just signed a salary agreement, a huge salary agreement that we changed for the first time the the salary for uh, for the new teachers. We also did for the first time we reward excellency. It's very hard with teacher unions to do something like this. And we also have a persistence grant that if you stay more than three years, you can kind of uh, grants. But that's just just uh, on the you know on the Maslow level. This is just the basic on the Maslow pyramid. It's just the basic. Next one. The second one is the personalization of teacher training. You probably some of you heard about a, a teach for all in Israel. It's the biggest one in the world. The teach for Israel. Uh, you have it all of, all over the world. But we created it for teacher training programs for different kind of um, um, uh, population. For example, uh, in Israel, you know that the high-tech industry is very, very strong. So the possibility for me to hire a physics, math, technology teacher is very, very hard because I'm, I'm competing uh, the, the biggest market uh, in Israel and one of the biggest in the world. So we changed it. We are not looking anymore for teachers when they are 24. We are looking them when they are 46, because in the high tech industry, they become old when they are 46 in my age. And now they are, and, and I can offer them now 20 years of a very satisfied uh, um, uh, job. I can, I can put them in a higher salary because they are already 46 with, and I can take their uh, everything they've done into a, a recognition. And that's how we change the whole system and we recruit a lot of uh, uh, math teachers on the next level of their life. Uh, we can do it with uh, uh, veterans from the army and, uh, and so on. Next one. Uh, the other thing is that we create uh, the training through professional learning communities. So we don't teach anymore teachers what to do, but we organize them in communities that they know each other. There is a lot of trust between them. And they, um, they're speaking about what doesn't work for us in, inside school. So it's not about getting information, but about bringing their own knowledge and, and, and do some kind of reflection about their practice. So it's bringing also the teacher status much higher we just started it, so you can see that in the pre-service, we already 50% are inside it, and in the rest, it's it's less. But we feel that uh, if you combine uh, teachers that are doing these communities inside schools and outside schools and with simulation centers, with actors, we, we managed to get to around 40% uh, percent of the teachers. Next one, please. The other thing is a, a managing the career path. You know, teachers sometimes think, okay, I'm becoming a teacher and that's what I'm gonna do the rest, until the rest of my life. It doesn't work anymore like this. So we need to make it a very com a competitive uh, a, 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 a profession to, to, uh, to attract a high quality human capital. And uh, that's what we do now. And the next slide, please. Uh, it won't be just about how many years you are a teacher, but about uh, uh, the role you take. And there is not only one route. It's not like a ladder that you have one route and every year you step another another um, a level, but it's it's more like a climbing wall. You know, the sometimes you need to get down a little bit to get to a higher uh, area. So we take the whole system and create it completely different with a, a lot of var variety of roles that you can uh, have. And um, that's something that we do, uh, we do just uh, right now. So it's salary, it's about a, a, a personalization of teacher training. It's about a very, uh, the community of learners throughout the professional development and career path. Next one. Thank you. Thank you.
Hey, Al, thank you so much for that. Really interesting as well to hear some of those very um, significant challenges that you're facing there in terms of recruiting teachers, especially with the high growth rate that you have. But that really, that insight into lack of flexibility, a particular issue uh, for the teaching um, side of things, for people thinking about going into teaching. And then your solutions, as you mentioned there on pay, personalizing training. I love that idea of looking at people who maybe are looking for a second career. Um, really interesting way of flipping things on its head. And then those professional learning communities and thinking of a career more as climbing a wall, the, the kind of climbing walls, the different routes that you can take. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for those wonderful opening presentations. We've got lots of questions coming in. So I'm actually going to go to the audience questions um, straight away. Um, there was one um, that came in. Thank you. Um, I think a couple have been answered uh, individually, but just for the um, purposes of everybody in the audience so that they can see, um, Andre Jolin asked um, on the back, because this came up in a couple of the presentations, how do the panel members see the trend of working remotely growing in order to retain um, employees? Israel, I'm going to come to you first. I see you've typed an answer. But if you just want, want to recap that just for the sake of everybody. So how do you see the trend of working remotely growing in order to retain employees? Uh, thank you. Well, as I typed in, in the answer box, uh, I need to see it uh, as a balance between the what the public worker wants, what's their interest, and what the organization needs, which is to uh, improve or uh, to uh, deliver uh, good public services with all the challenges the, the public administration has already. So I would need to, I would, I would stress the fact that uh, we need to find a, a right balance between the two or, or the, those two parties. Mm. Otherwise it wouldn't work. Mm. And what I mean by work, it means that, okay, the, the, the employee is happy in the organization, which is also giving them uh, some higher security uh, standards of of, uh, of labor and at the same time the organization needs to tackle their own challenges and which justifies the fact that they have these public services uh, sorry these public servants so it's a tricky thing and that is why uh, public managers uh, are, are there <laughs> so mm. try to risk an, an answer to this challenge but uh, in, in, in we need to find a balance and uh, i don't know i'm not sure if today we have this balance after the pandemic maybe we are still too too shocked after after this uh, uh, healthy health crisis thanks israel vicky over to you on this one do you think in the uk the kind of flexibility and the ability to work at home, is that helping to recruit and retain new people? I think it's a very live question and I would agree with Israel's identification of some tension between um, what might be the desires of some employees and might be um, uh, the needs of the role. But I also think that that's our job as public servants to think creatively and innovatively about how we can make the new ways of working strength because we certainly can attract um, different types of talent um, people who have commitments and might not be able to work the whole time in the office uh, or who have preferences to not do so will be attracted if we're able to um, make our the roles that we're offering in our administrations more flexible and work in different ways so in some ways it will be an advantage for us if we are able to really tackle the wicked problem as, as Israel called it. Thanks. Kyle, have you seen this tr trend of people being able to work from home? Like, how is that? Do people need new skills, for example, in managing hybrid teams going forward? How is that affecting training going forward? Yeah, it's a really good question. We've actually seen a boomerang effect globally where um, a lot of people started working remotely because they had to, and then they were getting pulled back into offices. And we're seeing this actually across corporations and across the public sector, be it in governments, be it in nonprofits, et cetera. Um, Al's point around how t teachers have to wake up and go to school every day, you know, that's certainly a sector that hasn't benefited from remote learning. But I think to your point around skills, yeah, we, we've seen uh, a lot of people looking to develop skills around managing remote work, people looking to existing organizations that do work remotely and saying, how do I actually do that better? Our company, for instance, 
it only has 1400 employees, but we went fully remote and there was a lot we had to learn to make that happen. And I do think we're seeing a shift to online learning to support remote workers. I would say, however, that people miss the blended learning experience. You know, we've actually seen that again with, to this boomerang effect, people are saying, look, the online learning is, is really great and I need to be with people in person mm. in some instances. And so a lot of organizations are trying to figure out that kind of hybrid model that Vicky mentioned. Um, and I think it's still a challenge. Thanks, Carl. Emmanuel, I'm coming to you. Do you. Is the kind of ability to work remotely helping you to recruit people that maybe you couldn't recruit before, especially maybe in rural areas, for example? Uh, yes, I think it has that advantage. Uh, working remotely, especially, would uh, encourage young, younger, the younger generation to join the public service. And of course, using technology is their thing. Uh, the older generation would have a bit of a challenge. Uh, but then, uh, as I said in one of the seminars, our major challenge is connectivity in some mm -hmm. parts of our area. Mm -hmm. So that uh, limits the extent to which we can go uh, fully uh, online. But yes. I think for productivity, especially when you look at the younger generation, they work much better uh, remotely. And uh, that flexibility uh, of not working from an office is, is, is very welcome. I agree with uh, Kyle, the, the, uh, the staff might miss that blended experience mm. uh, of working uh, together. So yeah, that might be a, a bit of a challenge. About the balance, yeah. Yes, yes. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, Al, I'm not going to ask you about working remotely because you've already said that's a big issue in terms of kind of incentives for teachers. But I am going to ask you the question that I think Emmanuel uh, was interested in, which is um, when you were talking about recruiting older teachers, so teachers that have had a previous kind of career, do you get challenges around kind of workplace experience or lack of workplace experience and cultural assimilation. So how well do those teachers manage to blend in in the classroom situation? Just to comment about the, the other uh, for a minute, uh, because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to recruit uh, teachers, but I also have more than 100 workers mm. inside the, the Ministry of Education. And, and then it really helped us, really, really helped us. And I, I love it. I think it's yeah. great. And, uh, I'm, I'm totally in favor and that's why i think it's such a problem with teachers because they don't they don't have the chance yeah um okay about the the culture um there is there is some tension about it but uh because i think that because uh, uh first of all teachers are around all the ages so it's not that they are uh, really uh, you know the, the old come the old people come they are coming when they are around 50 and we have teachers until 65 so there's no such a problem and it doesn't make the uh, population much older because we have so many teachers that we need. So at the end, and on the average of the OECD, we are still younger than the average, although we recruit a lot of second career uh, new teachers. Okay, thanks, Al. Um... Okay. But, but they bring, but they bring uh, just a, one more sentence, they bring some something with them. Yeah. You know, when you jump from the high tech, it's not just about the age, but about the culture. And we we're trying to assimilate it and and to make to make them uh, the 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 principal and the the head teacher of the school will see it and give it a place. Yeah. Thanks, Al. Okay. We had another question question in from Joanna um, Genovese, I think, who said, "Can you share your current experience of online training? So, have you simply shifted from providing?" What you used to you, what you used to provide as training to a Zoom platform, or are you taking this opportunity to invest in custom-made e-learning solutions? So, is it just the same training delivered on Zoom, or is online training now something different to the training that it was before? Kyle, very much your area of expertise. I'm coming to you first on this one. Yeah, so we've we've seen a, a huge uptake in interest from organisations and governments around learning more about online learning. I would say that they're cautious. Um, we know governments are, um, we have we have budget cycles, right? And we, we don't do single source like sometimes corporations would do. You need to have a competitive process. I think we've mentioned this before when we were discussing sometimes how it can be, I think Israel said, we can be slower to change because of the processes that we do have in place for good reason. Um, 
So we've seen an uptick in that interest. I will say that online learning as a as an industry has no panacea. So you know, Coursera, the company that I work for, we are almost never bought or used as the sole solution. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, governments are using multiple solutions at the same time. You may need um, cohort-based, really intensive leadership training. You may need broad digital literacy for your entire organization. You may need functional-specific training, like if AL's training teachers, right? You need to have teacher-specific training. You can't just take something off the shelf and say, hey, is it seems relevant to education, you have to make it specific. Yeah. So we've also started to notice this balance of what can we grab quickly off the shelf and deploy cheaply and at scale? What do we need to customize that we can work with a partner with? And what do we have to build ourselves? And I would say the market is very much moving towards providing governments with those first and second options of off the shelf. It's actually going to be really effective and helping governments to customize. But I'd love to hear what other people's experiences yeah, are. Yeah, thanks. Well, Vicky, I'm going to come to you on this. So to what extent is online training different from face-to-face -face training? And also, I want to, for you specifically, because Tim asked for you, Vicky, what's the utilization rate of virtual learning offerings versus those in your brick-and-mortar campus? So is there a higher take-up of virtual learning uh, than face-to-face -face learning? Um, so... I don't have the exact statistics and because we're at quite an early stage on the um, virtual versus um, bricks and mortar, I can't answer it with um, statistics. But what I would say is that um, I would echo one of the previous panelists talking about um, we really have had a strong um, demand for coming back face to face. So whilst we might have gone completely remote during COVID and um, people have said you cannot actually replace that and um, cohort based learning and the connections that you make with people it's very difficult to do that online we had one cohort during COVID which was very interesting in that they did manage to link together a very senior leaders but for the mm -hmm. most part what we hear um, is that people do want to spend time on them um, together face to face um, but the online learning we have used um, the third party platforms that we customize. So very much as Kyle was describing there, um, creating a course that's very tailored and has content that comes from um, central government often or with partners, but brings together a cohort of people who can go together. Um, I, I think pr providing training online as it was before and just expecting people to watch it, we haven't had success with that. We have needed to really tailor how we do it. Um, yeah. The other thing I think I would just bring out there is that although people say they want to come together face to face we've had a lot of comments about the um, benefits that come from bringing people who are geographically dispersed together quickly so that might be a really obvious thing to say mm. but for us somebody in the far north of the country and someone in the far south of the country it would be very difficult to get them to come together in um, one room for perhaps an hour but in fact they can do a learning session together uh, very quickly and then go back to the meetings they were having before and that we're seeing benefits there that we perhaps hadn't foreseen or thought through in terms of the um, savings that one can make economically but also from time wise. Thanks Vicky. Israel your thoughts on um, kind of the you know how different is online learning from the face-to-face -face? and also I see somebody has asked the question about what percentage of time should a member of staff be spending on training compared to focusing on service delivery? Yes, uh, well, mm, online learning is a specific uh, pedagogical approach to learning or to, to, to upskilling, to, to develop your uh, competencies. Uh, it doesn't cost less, and that is why we do that. It's a different environment, and it only changes the balance between what we, the, well, the legwork that we used to put, or that we put into you know the facilities and the classroom and whatever coffee breaks and stuff but uh it changes it to the demand a very clear demand we need to do to trainers now called dynamizers i don't know if that's english <laughs> but uh, you know people uh with a different approach to the learn learning process and we need or they need to customize and make it streamline uh, blended active they need to make it more practical and all the things that we know, but the difficult thing here is to bring it into the screen and mm -hmm. make people actively learn. And moreover, it is more in, in, interesting when you put it to leadership programs 
and you want to uh, improve the networking uh, aspect of training, which we cannot uh, take away our eyes from. And we do then this. For instance, as we speak, we have uh, 35 people who are going to chair working parties in the next Spanish presidency of the European Union. But yesterday, they had a few hours of online training, you know, on the on the basics, if you want. And today they are making simulation or uh, uh, games or call it what you want. But that's the approach, and as I see it, making the best of both worlds. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And I, and I want yeah. to be clear on that. Thanks. And the other question was, uh, uh, well, I wrote the, the percentage of time. That yeah, well, it's see. very difficult to answer because it depends. It depends on who, what profile, what for. I mean, a difficult, a wide range of, uh, of uh, variables. But there is this model of 10, 20, 30, uh, 70, like a pyramid. Maybe you know it. I'm, I'm quoting it by heart now. So maybe I might be wrong in percentages. But if you know that, it's, it's worth to take a look at it because it yeah. explains all this blending of learnings. Yeah, so, um, uh, Sean Nook um, has, has also said that and said L&D professionals know from countless research that 70, yeah. 20, 10 of adult learning, the most effective learning takes place outside the classroom. Exactly. So she's saying, you know, do we need to think more broadly about the culture? So we're learning outside the classroom as well as some of these formal settings uh, of learning. Uh, maybe somebody wants to pick up that on a moment. But Ayal, I want to come back to you, this sense of you mentioned in your presentation, very personalized training offers for people. Are you doing that online or are you doing that face to face? I think that the... Uh... The mix is uh, very important. Uh, I think people need to have their communities of learners because then they can share their, their practice and, and their, their experience. And, and that's the basic, I think. And then they can get the knowledge online. So it's different between something that it's like the family and something that you do outside. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, I think Emma. you need to find uh, this mix. Yeah, thank you. Emmanuel, you said you're increasingly using web-based solutions for training, web training. Are you just replicating what you would do face-to-face -face, or are you creating bespoke training offers online? Uh, no, no, I, I think I agree with the other responses. Uh, online is a specific pedagogic approach. We follow a different approach altogether. Um, Firstly, the, the approach itself is unpacked because uh, it's, there, there's no teacher. Uh, you actually basically take yourself through the course, but the basics might be given before one gets into the actual course. There will be some orientation. Mm -hmm. uh, supervision, yes, it will be there. So there'll be people uh, on the other side who can always provide the assistance. The teaching uh, is customized. Uh, uh, according to whatever topic that is going to be covered. But I think that for me, the major thing is the discipline. Uh, it's almost like one teaching oneself. So mm -hmm. the, the discipline of staying on the course uh, is quite important. Uh, therefore, it affects the percentage of time uh, you know, mm -hmm. that will be affected. Other than the content itself, etc., most of the courses that we have online uh, if they're accredited, one needs to spend at least 120 uh, hours on the course, uh, minimum. Yeah. So that will guide one in terms of whatever they do, but how you actually allocate that 120 hours is up to you, the, the person who's taking the course. Yeah. So yeah, that, that would be how we, we approach it. Thanks, Emmanuel. I'm Thank really you. conscious of the time. I can't believe how fast uh, the time has gone. And we've had some really great questions coming in. If we don't manage to get to your question, don't worry, we will try and make sure they're all answered uh, behind the scenes. Um, we might just have time, I think, for one final round, depending how long your answers are on this. But this was the very first question, actually, that came in. And I really like this question. I think it goes back to something Israel said about identifying a kind of public service calling and then developing the talent. It's a bit of a version of that. So Joel Cam said, um, many Western public services are merit-based, especially merit-based when it comes to hiring and promotion. Within this type of system, it means hiring competent people for any job role. 
such that training should not be required. Yet the underlying assumption of a lot of the presentations today is that re or upskilling is required. How does one reconcile this disparate approaches? Now, I don't think they're two different things, but I want to come back to all of you to give you a chance. So how do you reconcile kind of the need for training with a kind of competency based or merit based um, approach? I am going to start AL with you. We haven't given you the first chance to comment, but I'm going to do so on this one. I'm not sure what, what, what does it mean so much merit based, so I need some help with it. Sorry. Okay, well, I'm going to. So I think it's you, you bring people in on their kind of comp, their general competency, their general kind of ability to do a job rather than specific skills that they had. So I think Israel mentioned, for example, they look for somebody who has that kind of okay. willingness to work in the public sector and then the, the, the talent development will come afterwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, in a way, I. I I, I'm, I do believe in it. I, uh, I, I sometimes say, say that uh, one of the things that I'm asking in the interview is that I'm asking myself after if, I, if I'm willing to get into the car with this person now for three hours. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious enough to do it. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, I, uh, I feel there is something about, about the personality that is uh, is very very important more more even than the experience but it depends of of course of the on the on the job yeah you know? uh, for example in teachers it's it's completely different between primary school teacher and a high school teacher if it's a high school teacher that doesn't know physics you you won't take him to to teach physics but if you ask me about the primary so I, I prefer the, the personality, of course. So it's, it's, I think it depends, but I, I believe in it. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Well, Israel, I'm going to come to you because I think this was along the lines of what you were saying as well. Yeah, thank you. And it gives give me the chance to explain myself a little bit better. At least to say that uh, experience uh, gives you the, the, the real view of uh, this public service life, which is full of sacrifices. And uh, it's not easy, but it's so fulfilling that what I am saying is that when we recruit, we need to, again, strike the, 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 the perfect balance between someone who really wants to serve the, the public, who really wants to join us, you know, not because we are happy doing whatever we do, but also because there's this calling I, I mentioned, and talent needs to be balanced, not recruiting someone because it's full of talent that when comes into the organization and sees this, the miseries that we have, why not saying it, uh, becomes something like uh, what it's so-called, I think, hubris syndrome. So what I say is that let's find a balance, leave the training centers, the, 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 the opportunity to improve talents within the organization and focusing in the public services and values which is key and essential to, for instance, tackle diversity and try to make accessible public services and not only someone who feels that they're here, they're here because of merits and, mm. and that's it. So apart from that, um, well, I think that's uh, clear enough uh, and not to take a lot of time, but uh, well, there's a lot of things to say because it's touching upon the model of yeah. that we have the different systems in uh, across the, the, the world or, and I believe we have people from around the globe. So I don't want to go too much into detail, but I wish I could. Yeah, thanks Israel. Vicky, your thoughts on this? I guess it's that what can you teach and what does somebody bring with them originally, kind of what's inherent in them? Um, I think we've said this a couple of times, but I agree with them, my fellow panelists and what um, Israel was saying there about it being a balancing act. It absolutely is. Um, in the UK, it's really important that um, recruitment is merit based and that people we are transparent about what you need in order to get a job. But we try to balance that as well with not being too restrictive because you might get the wrong person if you have a long, long, long tick list that everyone has to fill in. You might miss out on a fantastic candidate so very much within our recruitment processes we've tried to think carefully about what do you really need and what is desirable but actually shouldn't be something that drops someone off the list of potentially coming in to be working in public service and mm. um, and because 
um, of what Israel has just said about our employee, employee value proposition, what we can offer people is not going to be a better salary than you might get in the private sector. But what we can offer is a place where we will invest in your skills, we'll invest in your knowledge, we will offer you opportunities for training. I think that should be part of what we're offering. Mm. I've typed that in the answer to one of the other questions. And we can offer, hopefully, an, an inclusive environment that makes people feel like they are valued um, and a highly purposeful um, calling and reason why they come to work every day. Um, and that, I think, is why we are going to... There was another question about should we be asking um, people to stay for three years type mm. somewhere. I think we're never going to get people to say that they can stay for a, a, a long time and do a good job if they're not happy. We should be focusing on giving people a good workplace um, and doing a good job and feeling valued because that's what will deliver high quality public services. Thanks, Vicky. And then, Emmanuel, your final thoughts on this issue of merit based. And uh, I mean, you already said that people need to demonstrate certain skills to go for promotion, but how do you ensure that good people then don't get overlooked? We need to take you off mute, Emmanuel. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, I agree with my fellow colleagues. Uh, panelists on this one, uh, through the initial training that an individual would have gone through uh, after schooling, etc., they would have at least uh, targeted themselves in terms of uh, a career passing. But uh, for recruitment, it's quite important. Uh, the, the balancing should be done. I, I agree on that one. The challenge, of course, is how shocked can we be that the, the recruitee will blend in the organization and also in terms of growing in that particular area. Uh, right now, despite the level of salary perhaps that they might expect, uh, mm -hmm. they might just want to be earning a salary. And so they will work uh, very hard to prove mm -hmm. themselves. So in a, in a way, uh, that might be a bit of a challenge. But yeah, I agree that uh, in that recruitment process, we need to really start to uh, strike a balance. Thanks, Thanks. Emmanuel. Kyle, we started with you. I'm going to come back and finish with you for your thoughts on this, but just reflections on kind of what struck you throughout the conversation as well. Yeah. I, I I thought this is so interesting. I mean, I learned a lot from everyone and, and thank you for the time and for joining. I think one thing that I noticed is we, you know, we don't all come from the same country, right? So um, the UK is not Spain, is not Israel, is not South Africa. And yet there are so many similarities. I think Vicky said something about, you know, there's a lot more we have in common than our differences referring to another group. But I think here that's also true. And um, one thing that seems to really resonate is that the public sector has a lot to offer talent. And it may not be in, you know, the, the ways that the private sector is from a financial standpoint, but if we look for people who have the right combination of, of that talent and then the, the desire to serve, who see their career being fulfilled, helping serve their fellow citizens, I think there's a lot to work with there. Then the question is, how do we continually give those people opportunities to grow in their careers within our governments, within the public sector? How do we continue to reskill and upskill? Um, so I, I actually feel very encouraged coming away from this about the, the current state at least in, in your countries, I don't know about other countries, but at least in, in the organizations that all of you are working for and the entities, um, I just wanna say thank you for, for everything that you've done. And uh, again, really appreciate the discussion. Thanks so much, Carl. Um, sadly, we are out of time. Um, I just want to echo uh, thanks to all of you on the panel for giving us such great expertise and all of your time. I think everybody in the audience will uh, have sympathy with the fact that, that civil services, public servants around the world are facing some really big challenges. So it's more important than ever that we get great people into the public sector and that they do have the kind of training and skills needed to meet those uh, massive challenges facing the world at the moment. And I think you've all provided a lot of hope there in terms of what the future might look like uh, for uh, public servants. So Thank you to the audience as well um, for sending in so many great questions. Um, we will be sending everybody who registered and everybody who attended a questionnaire. If you don't mind taking a few minutes just to fill that in, it means we can keep giving you exactly the webinars that are most useful for you. Um, there's some information on your screens about one of our upcoming webinars as well um, and more information about all of our webinars can be found on our website so please do uh, check that out 
We will also be sending round a link with this video from today's conversation so you can watch it all again if you found it really interesting and you can share it with your colleagues. And there will be an article in a week or so um, covering all of the key points that came out of today. Um, and that will be sent round to everybody who registered as well. Thank you so much to Kyle, to Israel, to Vicky, to Emmanuel and to Al for being a fantastic panel. Thanks to Coursera for being our uh, knowledge partner today. And I hope we see you all on another one of our webinars very soon. But for now, enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are. Thanks from me. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.